All right, I am going live just uh, a little bit early this time around because we've already got some questions lined up in the corner. And I decided to let my hair down since I, uh, I just got out of the shower and I need to get it to dry a little bit more. And it's nice not to bind it up so tightly all the time. So I'm going to start uh, answering questions in just a minute, waiting for people to stream in. And uh, glad to have all of you here. I'll say that. It's always fun doing these. Um, this is a particularly nice weekend for, for me in part because it's uh, I've got a few things planned, but not too much work. And I think I'll get to go out and about in the city in just a little while and maybe take a walk and take some pictures and stuff like that. All right. It's getting close to the start of the hour. So let me start on the first question, which is an interesting one. Um, from Isaac, do you think it's fair that Camus and Heidegger are often placed under the existentialist umbrella, despite both refuting the label? If so, why? Totally fair. Uh, you know, consider whether Hume would be, you know, whether it's fair to call him an empiricist or whether it's fair to call Spinoza a rationalist, even though they may not have used those terms. There is, you know, when we're looking at language, we have to understand that terms don't just have one single fixed meaning. They, they mean multiple things. And existentialist is both a term that can have a very precise meaning, in which case you're ta what you're talking about with Heidegger and Camus, and also I should point out Marcel, the first person to use the word existentialist in French, not refuting, but refusing is what you meant. Um, there's that sense. And then there's the broad sense in which we're talking about, you know, a, a movement of thought and they are existentialist. I'm going to turn on some lights here because it's, I notice it's kind of dark in this, uh, this area. Um, they are existentialists in, in that broad sense. And I have no problem calling Heidegger an existentialist. He uses the words existential over and over again in his works. Um, Camus, when he's talking about the existentialists, he has some very precise people in mind, but he's he's doing the same themes as uh, many of the other existentialists. So there's zero problem doing that. And um, this comes up over and over again. People think that that, you know, um, the fact that that Sartre tried to control effectively and gatekeep the term. Um, and then these other people were like, we're not playing your game, buddy, including Marcel and Heidegger. Uh, should be important. But no, when we're teaching and we're talking about broad movements in philosophy, it's perfectly fine to, you know, use these, uh, uh, you know, capital E existentialist terms like that. Uh, Damn it, Albert says, some religion teachers suggest children ought not to be taught religion by parents while they're young due to the influence it can have on them uh, versus when it's done in a controlled environment. Uh, meaning a classroom like yours. That strikes me as a very stupid point of view for religion teachers to have. And it's probably a result of bigotry on their part or just ignorance, um, you know, about how things actually work in the real world. I mean, if you think that uh, that children are not going to be getting messages about religion from the general culture before they get into a classroom environment, you're crazy. Um, and I, I actually think that it's great for parents to teach kids something about religion because that way at least they have something to when they're teenagers and rebellious to reject and to push against, right? Now, obviously, we don't want religion as abusive indoctrination, but, you know, that's, that's less often the case and much more often the case is a kind of lukewarm, know-nothing, well, let's just go to class, you know, communion and CCD. I don't know why we're doing any of this stuff, but it's just what we do. That's much more common in my experience. Um, and I mean, who are the teachers to think that somehow they are the ones who are providing the definitive take on, on religion? This seems just to me very unworkable. Um, I wouldn't say that my peers in religious studies are, um, you know, necessarily the best bunch to be teaching things. It's kind of a wide spectrum. So, yeah, I don't really, I don't really uh, buy into that. 
Uh, Colomus, any thoughts about the intersection of climate with politics and ethics? Well, there ought to be a lot more intersection and, and not the kind of refusal, oh, there is no, no climate issue happening. I mean, this is, what, this is an existential issue in the other sense of the term, meaning that if we don't figure it out, we're all dead. <laughs> Human culture is over uh, if we don't get our, our act together and we can't act uh, in, in concerted ways. And the selfishness and foolishness of a lot of people is standing in the way. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of intersections between those. Um, IDK, what do you think about dark enlightenment and CCRU thinkers like Mark Fisher and others? I haven't read Mark Fisher's um, work, so all I can do is, you know, go by like thumbnail sketches of it. It seems like, you know, an interesting idea. Um, you know, if we're talking about the idea that uh, capitalism is the, the milieu that we're stuck in anyway, okay. I mean, um, Fukuyama said that as well years ago. So that by itself doesn't strike me as all that um, interesting of a thesis. Um, dark enlightenment. Dark enlightenment is a, sort of a repetition of the, the bullshitting around that we saw um, in the early 20th century in a lot of authors. You know, when I was first reading Mencius Moldbug back, man, this was, uh, well, was before I left Indiana. So um, before 2008, I was like, well, there's really little new about this other than the terminology. It's interesting that you can repackage this stuff, uh, this traditionalist stuff, and then add a few new interesting twists and put it on the internet, and people will be like, oh my God, this is so new, you know? Um, so that's, I mean, that's my take uh, on on the dark enlightenment stuff. It's interesting to look at, but it's it's ultimately, I don't think, a, a way forward for anybody unless you're you're into that sort of me against the world, you know, kind of kind of thing. NL, do you have any opinions about Walter Kaufman? Um, I mean, I like Walter Kaufman. Um, you know, I enjoy reading his uh, his little asides as he's translating things. He was kind of a uh, a big deal back when I was a, a undergraduate student, but that's just because my professors were so behind the times. Um, Mark Smith. Uh, Hope, you, hope you're doing well. Look forward to these AMAs. Yeah, I'm, I always look forward to seeing Mark here. Um, all right, Massacre, do you think that science oversteps on trying to answer fundamentally phil philosophical questions like the question of free will, God, beginning of the universe? Do you think science could ever answer it? So there is no such thing as science um, as a single thing. There are scientists, there are sciences, there are all sorts of pro practices and processes, and no one single person like has a grasp on all of what's going on with, with science. Um, very often when we see people making claims that are in, invoking science that are about free will or God, you know, th those sorts of things, they're not actually doing science. They're doing pseudoscience. Um, a lot of neuroscience is pseudoscience unfortunately, and probably will remain so for a long time. Or they're, they're doing science reporting where they're reading somebody else's studies, and then in order to make it sexy and interesting, they're like taking a tiny little conclusion about a very small group and blowing it up into, we have no free will or, or st silly stuff like that. Um, and then there's the, you know, sciencey popular writers who go way beyond their their boundaries and so you know should we should we criticize science for that no because those people aren't really doing science um, they're they're going beyond the scope of legitimate science and we also have to clarify what do we mean by science um, depending on what language and culture we're in science might include uh, you know, uh, linguistics or history or philosophy, you know, um, there's, there's a, these sort of questions are, are rather hard to, to answer in the way that they're, they're framed. Um, Cork Mars, what readings, if any, would you recommend to someone studying social and political foundations of education, which on education types books, essays? I mean, I'm not, I'm not a philosophy of education person, so I'm, I'm not really a great person to ask about that. But, um, you know, I would say offhand, um, of course, Plato's 
Plato's works, uh, not just the Republic, but some of the other ones, read Aristotle. He has a lot of stuff to say about education, particularly in book three of the rhetoric. And we can just like move on forward through the ages into all sorts of uh, other things all the way down to the present. I mean, John Dewey, of course, is a big person, but I, I kind of like overdosed on Dewey when I was in graduate school because I went to Southern Illinois University where uh, lots and lots of people are into Dewey. And so I, I you know, whenever people mention him, I always have a little kind of <laughs> taste, but, he, you know, he's an important philosopher for that. So I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not really uh, somebody to, to survey the field on that. Um, Galen, did you ever in your medieval philosophy readings ever do any reading in St. Bonaventure? Any thoughts? Do you consider him more just a theologian? So I will say this, I don't buy the hard and fast distinction between philosophy and theology that a lot of people like to make. So the notion of just a theologian, I think that's kind of kind of bullshit myself because, um, you know, the same thing can be looked at in both philosophical and theological ways, right? We don't want to be too doctrinaire about that. Yeah, I've read Bonaventure. Um, I'm not, I'm not that into him, you know. Um, I've, I haven't, uh, you know, read extensively in him, but I read some of his stuff a while back. I'm, I probably should go back to him and reread him. But this time around when I'm teaching medieval philosophy, I'm actually teaching just from Augustine up to Bernard of Clairvaux and Hildegard of Bingen, uh, just, you know, uh, the early people and uh, Benedictines. I'm not teaching any Franciscans or Dominicans. And I'm not really going too far into the high middle ages, frankly. Um, so I, I don't know when I'll get to reading him again. Uh, OSH, do I have any thoughts on later Heidegger in comparison with his early period? I, I prefer the early period stuff myself, um, but I don't see a radical break or distinction. You know, the Kara is still the same guy. Kara means turning, is still the same guy turning in a different direction, right? And so, um, you know, there's there's some cool stuff in there, um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't I don't think we have to make too much of this this massive distinction. Uh, it's not like say early Wittgenstein and late Wittgenstein, you know, where late Wittgenstein is like, wow, that guy was was really screwing up, and this Tractata stuff, you know, forget about that, right? Um, all right, uh, Edwin Mayer said thoughts on Lemaitre and Descartes. I don't really remember that much about Lemaitre other than you know the notion of man as machine, so there's nothing for me to say about that. Western man, if you sum up the difference between Heidegger and Hegel in one sentence, what would that be? I wouldn't sum it up in one sentence, so that doesn't really uh, make sense for, for me. I mean, two very complex thinkers. Uh, I mean, Heidegger came after Hegel. That, <laughs> Here you go. That that might be all that we can do with that. Um, let's see here. Latham tried to read Baudrillard, expecting something interesting. Is he just a bad writer, or am I missing something? Both. <laughs> Baudrillard, you are missing something in Baudrillard, and he's a bad writer, but he's not a bad writer in the sense of like in an in an objectively bad way where it's rooted in who he is and you just can't write. The problem is it has to do with French writing post 1950. And Baudrillard is just sort of a typical representative of that. And you can find some elements of that earlier than, you know, the fifties. But for the most part, when you look at French writing in the early 20th century, it's pretty clear. I mean, it may be very embellished, it may be expressing quite complex thoughts. You know, people used to criticize Maurice Blondel for being um, like Hegel and being like Cicero and writing these massive sentences that are actually a whole paragraph. Um, but if you spend your time on it, you can figure out what's going on. And then, you know, all these plays on words and, you know, trying to make text speak in, in many different ways to the reader that comes about after the, the 1950s and, and through the 1950s. And I would say, you know, other people that fall into that, obviously Derrida, Deleuze comes to that. Sometimes Foucault can be very precious 
that way. Roland Barthes, you know, Jacques Lacan was kind of an asshole in doing that himself. Um, there's there's a lot of that going on. Well, and we can we don't have to just bash guys. We can talk about Chris Davin or Rigore and Sisu and all of them. It became like the way to talk. Jean Luc Marion is is you know sometimes subject to that sort of thing to take a contemporary thinker. Um, and so no, it's 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 there is something there. You have to work to get it. They're going to make you to work to get it. They do they make it unnecessarily difficult for you to do that. And it's a, it's a kind of gatekeeping, you know, frankly, uh, within their little world and within the world of people who spend their, their time and life invested in talking about um, late 20th century French philosophy, unfortunately. So, yeah, I, that's, that's my take on that. As somebody who's been reading that stuff for 30 years, you know, and almost wrote my dissertation on, on Derrida and then wrote on, on um, Maurice Blondel. All right. Uh, Fabian says, I sometimes get distracted in my philosophy learning path. It's difficult to get back on track. Any tips for staying the course? Okay. So yeah, I do have tips, uh, tips going both ways. So let's talk about after you've left the path, right? I mean, the good thing about philosophy is that you can always go back to it. It's not like, um, you know, the, the, the schools are going to close and you missed the boat and now you'll never be able to, to go there. There's a helicopter flying overhead. I don't know if you can all hear that. There must be something going on today or, or there's some police matter. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's always the possibility of getting back into it. Uh, be, you know, be gentle with yourself when it comes to that. Say, listen, I went off the path. Um, I'm, I don't have to like do immediately exactly what I was doing before. It's enough if I just find some time to read and reflect and maybe do a little writing or things like that. Um, to avoid falling off the path, you know, maybe what you want to do is what I did with exercise. I was finding um, that although we had a gym membership to a gym that I really like to go to, uh, I wasn't actually getting to it because I would say, I'm going to go at the end of the work day and then work would just pile up through it and I'd be tired and I'd be like, oh, I'll do it. I'll do it tomorrow. So what I started doing is creating calendar appointments for myself as if I was meeting with a client or blocking out some time for reading or you know whatever else it is that I do, housework, cooking, you know. And I would treat it as if it's an appointment that I have to show up for, right? And now you could do that with your philosophical reading. You can be like, from 7 to 9 p.m. tonight, I am reading, you know, uh, William James' Varieties of Religious Experience. Or I am reading, uh, well, here's my book, <laughs> Reason Fulfilled by Revelation, right? Or whatever, um, and, and make it into like your, your own appointment with those authors. And I found that that helped. It might not work for everybody, but I, I think it could be helpful for you. Um, all right, let me check what this super chat is. Dan says, I uh, wanted to thank you for hard work on Half Hour Hegel. I devoted myself to the phenomenology of spirit this year, and it's been an invaluable to find videos by paragraph number question favorite motorhead album so we got we got a metal question um what is that's a, that's so i can i can tell you the, the ones that i like the best are mostly the ones really running up to the the mid 80s um i i like the later stuff right but it just doesn't have the same gripping power as it does for me from their first maybe like 10 years you could say um i mean i really like bomber and overkill um and then another perfect day is really good um i mean i i like ace of spades i like iron fist those are awesome as well but I probably would say Overkill is my my favorite one, in part because of Overkill, but it also has you know these really kind of jazzy, trippy things like Capricorn and Metropolis, right? So yeah, all right. Let's let's come back to these other. Um, 
Is this O S H? I think so. Um, do you think that had Heidegger written a large systematic book of his later thought, like being in time, he would have gotten as famous as he did early on. I personally find his later area era wider. Um, I mean, he is super famous, so I don't think that he had to write a big book in order to become famous. Um, there's places where continental philosophy basically begins with Heidegger, even in the present. So I don't think that's an issue. Um, I don't find his later era, era wider, but that's because I look at the seminars that he, he provided in his early period and there's an incredibly wide range of stuff that he's he's examining and, and covering. Um, you know, just take a look at his his four volume Nietzsche lectures, for example, right? So, yeah, I mean, I think one big book is probably enough, right? Uh, IDK, what's your opinion on the role of Islamic medieval philosophers? Do you think they are underappreciated in their role in philosophy, specifically by Western thinkers? Yes and no. I mean, they're there in the mix. Um, if you're looking at Thomas Aquinas, for example, um, there's an Aquinas in the Arab Projects based right here in Milwaukee at Marquette University. Um, there, are, there are graduate students studying with Richard Taylor, studying Arabic so they can read Avaros and you know Ibn Sina and people like that. So I, I think it really depends on where you are. Um, you know, you do need, I think if you're going to talk about them intelligently, you do need to like be able to read the original language just as you would need to be able to read Latin or uh, Greek, right? So that that's kind of an important factor and that, that probably holds some people back, right? Um, are they un unappreciated in some areas? Yeah, but um, not, not in others, I'd say. Um, and, you know, the issue is often, if you're going to teach medieval philosophy, how much can you actually cram into a semester? I mean, I, I have to do triage every time that I teach a class. I can't teach everybody who I'd like. So, all right. Uh, OSH, I found Heidegger's later ontology with a replacement of identity with difference and the event overall thinking of things is similar to Deleuze's difference and repetition. Do you think he got influenced by Heidegger? I mean, everybody got influenced by Heidegger in one way or another, even Levinas, <laughs> who is uh, directly opposing Heidegger uh, and, and calling him out on stuff. Um, sure, people, people get influenced by all sorts of people. And Heidegger is influenced by Kierkegaard and by Nietzsche. And there's all these flows of inf influence coming through people. Nobody's like a self-made philosopher. Um, the question is always about how much influence and, and what kinds of ways, right? All right, made of clay, do you think a philosophy degree works best in tandem with another in this day and age? I want to get my degree in philosophy and use it with a career in mental health counseling, so I'd need to. Well, if, yeah, that's the kind of path you're going on. You definitely need something in your content area, um, just as if you were going to be, you know, get a degree in philosophy and work in a library, you also get a degree in library science, right? Or if you're going to do a um, uh, degree in philosophy and yet you also want to work in something where mathematics is important or computer science, get a degree in that. It's Usually it's pretty easy to double major in philosophy <laughs> and something else. Philosophy degrees are fairly easy to come by compared to some other ones. Um, so th yeah, that's, that's, that's usually a good idea. I got a degree in philosophy and in mathematics. Not deliberately, you could say, but just by inertia. I, I like taking both sets of classes. I actually did consider getting a major in history as well because at the place that I was going to, my history of philosophy classes would count for the major, and I'd taken a few others. So all I would need to do is take three more history classes, and I could have had a triple major. But I, I wanted to get out of school, so, so I, I didn't do that. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, it, it wouldn't hurt you to do that. Um, obviously, you know, how long you stay in school and how, how to pay for it is sometimes uh, an issue for, for some people. My oldest daughter, who's in college right now, is like acutely conscious, even though she's going to a place that's quite cheap to go to, U University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, she wants to be done in those four years, right? And I keep telling her, it's, you know, you don't have to rush, it's not that big of a deal, you know, but 
sometimes people get that in their head and, and that can that can constitute an impediment right so um yeah but if you're doing mental health counseling you got to do like psychology or or counseling or something along those lines don't you all right uh team ajo um, do you have a favorite Frankfurt school philosopher Adorno from Horkheimer Benjamin? Will you do core concept video on the culture industry? Well, that's not a bad idea, actually. Um, I, now everybody's, everybody's always asking me, will you do a video on, if I'm going to do a work, there's going to be a whole set of videos because the whole point of core concept videos is to go through a work and isolate out some of the key ideas, arguments, distinctions, and so, you know, you, 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 you can expect to see a series and the culture industry wouldn't be bad to do. I mean, most of my core concept videos are specifically on <clears throat> um, texts that I'm teaching in class. And so like this coming semester, I've got to do some more existentialism things. Like I'm probably going to do Kierkegaard's sickness onto death. So you can, you can expect to see some core concept videos on that. And um, I might, you know, I might do a few other authors I haven't hit on before. Um, and then I'm teaching medieval philosophy. So I got to do some on Augustine, do some on Boethius. I've got some on Anselm, but I got to do more. Some on Abelard, some on um, Gregory the Great, my, my namesake, the guy I was named after. I'm doing Moralia and Job, just parts of it, and maybe some other things. So, you know, that's going to keep me kind of busy for a while. But, yeah, I could do that. Now, my favorite Frankfurt School philosopher, hands down, it's Adorno. Adorno is very, very difficult because of the nature of his writing to, to do scholarship on, I've found. You know, I, I published one article years and years ago, way back when I was just out of graduate school, on Adorno, which has been incorporated into some, you know, some texts and, and stuff like that. Um, and that's the, the last thing I've managed to produce on Adorno <laughs> in 20 years. Um, but I do like Adorno. I disagree with him about jazz, of course. But even, do you have any favorite board games, card games, or strategy games? Um, yeah, card games. You know, my wife and I, have started um, just for, for fun playing Rummy 500. That was a big favorite when I was a kid. Whenever you'd like be you know stuck in a tent on a camping trip because it's raining, or you know you know you're waiting in a hospital for somebody who's sick or stuff like that, we play Rummy 500. Um, I come from a family that was a big card playing family, so we used to play Pinochle a lot. I really enjoyed that. We would play up to eight handed with three decks sometimes and everything all the way down to two person pinochle and everything in between five, five handed is probably my favorite. Um, and we used to do that a lot before, you know, all my older relatives died off, you know, uh, so we used to play cribbage a lot too, you know, but it, most of the people I used to play with are, are long dead again. Um, here in Wisconsin, of course, Sheep's Head is a big uh, card game. I haven't played it for a long time, but that would be fun to do. I used to play a lot when I was in college. As a matter of fact, we actually had a party room where we played Sheep's Head about three, three nights a week and got, you know, we'd drink beer and listen to music and have a good time. Um, board games, um, I mean... The last board game that I played was when my kids were here and we played Settlers of Catan. We also have some Rick and Morty board games that are that are fun too, but we haven't played those for a long time. We haven't we haven't gotten together as uh, all three of us uh, since COVID hit. So yeah, and and I haven't um, I haven't been out. You know, there's board game places around here, but I just haven't gotten into to doing that. But I, I did enjoy that that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah. Ruben says top three favorite movies. I mean, I love The Duelist. Um, that's an early Ridley Scott movie. Um, after that, it's kind of hard to say, you know. Um, there's a lot of movies I've seen, and I'll think about them every once in a while. I guess you could say, that, what are my favorite movies that have really, really stuck with me? I mean, maybe Memento, um, Christopher Nolan's movie. I used to use it in class a lot. Um, to discuss identity and memory. Um, trying to think of anything I've seen that's really, really good that massively impressed me. 
lately. You know, I saw the new Dune movie and I, I enjoyed it. I wouldn't say it's like one of my favorite movies, but uh, people who are saying, oh, no good, you know, it, it actually was. It stuck pretty close to the book. There's some weird people out there that are like, there's some sexual tension between Paul and his mother. And I think there's some sexual tension in their heads that they're reading into the thing. I didn't actually see that in, in the, the movie. Um, I thought that, you know, most of the scenes are pretty well done. Um, you know, it, it captures kind of the, the feel of the books. So, yeah. All right. So that's not really a full answer, but the best I can provide. Irony and crisis. I wonder if you could clarify your position on mindfulness. I noticed some skepticism in your early Hegel lectures, but realize you see it as part of the Stoic tradition too. Yeah, I think a lot of the people that talk about mindfulness are just full of shit. I mean, it's woo-woo kind of stuff uh, at one spectrum. There is some legitimate mindfulness stuff, but any legitimate mindfulness stuff is almost always within a spiritual tradition, and it becomes more woo-woo bullshit the more that you peel it out of that tradition and turn it into its own thing. I mean, I know that there's studies out there, but there's studies on everything, right? And um, it can be good to meditate, but you don't have to do mindfulness meditation. You, there's lots of other kinds of meditation too. So the mindfulness industry, I think, is bullshit and exploitative and elitist and silly. Um, mindfulness as something that's not that, okay. But now you're talking about mindfulness within a context and the context matters. So I think at, I, I think I've been like super clear about this the entire time, you know? Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you one example of one silly person. So I, I participated in this Harvard study at the Culinary Institute of America that was aimed at like wellness and weight loss and all these sorts of stuff. And they put all these different components together. They gave us a life coach. My life coach wasn't worth a shit because she was a positive psychology person. And a lot of that's bullshit too. You know, some of it isn't, some of it is. You got to like see through the, the stuff that is and isn't. Um, and uh, they give you, you know, cooking lessons from the chefs at the culinary about healthy eating and some demonstrations and, you know, hands on stuff. And um, they gave us a gym membership, which was totally useless because it was for a gym that was located on the other side of the Hudson River, so we could never make it there. And um, they, you know, they'd take our bloods and and do all sorts of readings every so often, and have us fill out all these inventories. And then they had a mindfulness coach as well brought in, and the mindfulness coach was the typical, like st stereotypical hippy dippy you know, 60 something talks in a soft voice lady who was going to do mindfulness with us. And it was like a total failure, by the way, uh, when she's trying to lead these culinary people who are all like super type A personalities, uh, they, it actually increased their level of anxiety. And unfortunately, the guy who was in charge of the study was captivated with mindfulness. He was another boomer too. You know, boomers love mindfulness shit and the, the hippy dippy shit, right? And so he was like always talking about we need to be mindful of this and mindful of that. And after a while, every time that he'd say the word mindful, everyone would be like, oh, you could hear this collective groan it, because there's a lot of people who believe in it like they believe in other panaceas. So my bottom line, mindfulness is good in a context when it's connected with other stuff. On its own, it's silly bullshit. And um, there's also another aspect to it as well, which is it becomes a substitute for actual medical care or psychological counseling or all the other things that should be provided. And there's a lot of, you know, let's provide people mindfulness things at work and then they can be better productive employees stuff going on as well. So I'm not, I'm not a fan of all that sort of stuff, right? Um, Bill, can we look at eternal recurrence as a psychological trick? Yeah, I mean, you can do anything you like. Right? Anything can be looked at in any way. The question is whether there's a legitimacy to that. And I mean, what else could the eternal recurrence be? Uh, can you actually like prove that, that it's taken place or anything like that? I mean, even the way that Nietzsche frames it, it is not a metaphysical assertion about reality. It is a put yourself into this sort of mindset and imagine what would happen. Hey, if eternal recurrence does something for you, great. I always found it to be something that 
you know, I, I have zero interest in the eternal recurrence of the same, quite frankly. Um, and I've never, I've never found it to be a particularly important or interesting doctrine. Um, I think a lot, uh, way too much gets made of it. Uh, Josh, do you agree with Popper that all positions must be falsifiable? No, because that position itself isn't even falsifiable. I mean, this is one of the problems with these people who have like the one big thing that's going to like solve things. I mean, look at air verification principle, right? Is that verifiable? No. So you got a problem there, a sort of meta problem. And Popper is, is uh, Popper's a mix of like interesting and well worth talking about stuff and then absolute ridiculous misreadings and mischaracterizations of other, other philosophers. Um, I, I'm not saying you shouldn't read Popper, but man, was that guy a mess <laughs> when it comes to philosophy. All right, uh, Rima, uh, what do you think of Merleau-Ponty, especially in relation to Husserl and Heidegger? Merleau-Ponty is much more readable than Husserl or Heidegger. Uh, as a matter of fact, interestingly, in the early days before Husserl started getting translated into French, um, people thought that Merleau-Ponty, because he'd studied with, with Husserl, was actually like a faithful representation of Husserl. I think Merleau-Ponty, um, his stuff is, is well worth reading and checking out and thinking through. I like the phenomenology of perception. Um, Merleau-Pontyans, because I've been to the Merleau-Ponty circle a couple times, kind of a mix of rigorous phenomenologists, and uh, he attracts a lot of woo-woo, you know, new agey kind of people too. And then everything in between, you know, so. All right. Uh, Cork Mars, what is your assessment of Whitehead and process philosophy? Um, Whitehead is an interesting guy. You haven't read um, uh, Process and Reality for, you know, in whole for over 20 years. So uh, that was a big thing when I was an undergrad. I worked my way through the book, probably didn't understand most of what I was actually reading any more than I did when I was, you know, reading other people as an undergraduate, like Sartre's Being a Nothingness. Um, I, th I thought it was cool stuff. I might return to it someday. Um, and I, I like Whitehead's other stuff. I think that a lot of people, you know, it's sort of like with Hegel, right? People are like, oh, I'm going to have to study Hegel. I got to read the phenomenology. Probably not. You probably should read some other stuff before the phenomenology because the phenomenology is a tough book. You know, like with Whitehead, you could read some of his other easier books before you go to process and reality. And um, you'd probably benefit from it. So, you know, that, that could be a, a, an assessment, I suppose. Um, Kier Levy, do you think Plato's conclusions are relevant today? His assumptions that whoever knows justice does justice makes it hard for me to agree with almost all his claims. Well, that's, that's silly for you to put it like that. Um, you should be able to handle him talking about one thing without dismissing all of his other claims. That's less about Plato and more about you. And so you probably want to rethink that. Um, I wouldn't focus so much on Plato's conclusions. And first of all, w Plato's conclusions, where's Plato in the dialogues? Do you, do you have a guy who's actually there as Plato? Oh, you're assuming Socrates' conclusions are uh, Plato's conclusions, right? Where are the conclusions? Are they always there or do they sometimes leave things open and you have to like draw your own conclusions? You want to think about this sort of stuff before you start generalizing about, about Plato as a whole um, or go to some, some really great commentators and see what, what they actually take Plato's views to be and see what, what sort of uh, uh, modes of argumentation there are for them and what would be required on your part to understand them. You know, because Platonism is not something where it's like, well, you know, premise one, premise two, conclusion. That's not the way that platonic dialogues work. And that's not the way that argument works in the real world. It's assumed that there's some work on the part of the person as well as just some some text there. Right. Um Massacre, would you consider Heidegger an atheist, even though his philosophy is ripe for Christian appropriation? I wouldn't worry about whether Heidegger is an atheist. I, I don't see how that matters at all. Um, so that, that would be my answer to it. Raid, besides being in time, what do you think are Heidegger's best works? You know, I haven't read all of Heidegger's works, so I, I, I probably am going to be off on this. 
but I think his, um, you know, basic problems of phenomenology is pretty, pretty awesome to read. I like his, uh, Nietzsche lectures. He's got lectures on all sorts of other cool stuff as well. Some of which I've read, some of which I haven't, um, like his lectures on, on Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. I kind of wish that he hadn't ended them so early with the self-consciousness section. I would love to see what he made of the spirit section, but you know, and then he's got like, you know, phenomenology of the religious life. He's got a lot of great lectures on Aristotle. So, you know, there's, there's some really wonderful stuff. You notice that the stuff I'm talking about is pretty much early Heidegger and then, and then uh, lectures. I mean, there's also some great essays, some of which I've done videos on, like, you know, what is metaphysics that I use as my introductory text for, for people to study Heidegger. Um, you know, on the essence of truth, the problem concerning technology. These are all great works, right? So, um, what do you, what's your opinion on Kuhn versus Popper debate? I don't have an opinion. So, um, Imbaba, Imblabenia, Jamir, any suggestions on reading Levinas for a beginner? Um, yeah, I mean, expect that it's going to be complex and difficult. There isn't, as far as I know, there's no like one single text that you could say, here's the place to start with Levinas, but I'm not a Levinas scholar. So I, I don't, I don't really know. And I don't read him very often, frankly. Um, ben Feltz, views on Hillary Putnam and the relatively recent influence of pragmatism. I don't have any views on Hillary Putnam. I mean, he actually came to my to my graduate school, gave a talk, and I couldn't tell you what it was about. Um, I don't think that. I mean, you can study pragmatism without, you know, studying Hillary Putnam. I mean, I just brought up this book earlier, right? Um, pragmatism has not gone away. Hillary Putnam is not the person responsible for it not going away. It's everybody else who's reading uh, James and Peirce and Royce and and Dewey and you know following them through into the present. So I, I don't know. Um, Mike Ron, why do you think young people and folks get attracted to existentialist absurdist philosophy so much? And how does one get over it? I don't know that, that it's uh, there's that many young people who are attracted to existentialist or absurdist philosophy. Um, I mean, I don't know that there's that many people attracted to philosophy per se among any generation. Um, and why would you want to get over it? I mean, how do you know that you should get over it? I, I'm still reading and rereading existentialist texts in my 50s and finding things that I missed when I was into them as a teenager and 20-something. Um, I mean, some of the stuff gets gets pretty old pretty quick. Like think about Waiting for Godot by Beckett. Okay, you read it once. It's, it's It held up oh, this great canonical text, but I mean, you read it once, you, you pretty much tapped it out, right? Uh, and that's actually much more absurdist than it is existentialist. Existentialism is, is serious philosophy and literature about the problems of life, looking at things through uh, a bunch of different important concepts like anxiety and the importance of emotions and, you know, the centrality of looking at one's concrete existence and thinking about death and thinking about life and all those sorts of things. That's that's serious philosophy. A lot of absurdist stuff degenerated just into people saying random crap, you know, and uh, thinking that they were being somehow liberated or profound. Um, but you can reread Sartre, you can reread Nietzsche, you can reread, um, you know, Kafka to take a literary figure and get tons and tons out of it throughout your life. So why would you want to leave it behind? Why wouldn't you just want to incorporate it into a larger life, right? Um, Francisco, is Thomism generally, generally neglected in most philosophy undergraduate programs? If so, why? Almost everything is neglected in most undergraduate philosophy programs. So there's nothing special about Thomism. Um, even Descartes is often neglected in most philosophy programs, you know, like a serious reading of Descartes that goes beyond Meditations 1 and 2. Um, I mean, Thomism probably, you could say, is on the wane in Catholic universities and, and uh, colleges because uh, people are kind of tired of, of Thomas being a bunch of uh, elitist uh, gatekeeping jerks, which they were, you know, throughout the early 20th century. 
well into like the 80s. There's lots of great exceptions, you know, but, um, you know, there's a lot of mediocre Thomists out there, just like there's a lot of mediocre analytic philosophers. There's also, you know, an intersection of them, analytic Thomists, most of whom are um, mediocre in my point of view and, and get Thomas wrong. Um, but, you know, it, you can say the same of so many other things as well. I don't think there's any sort of grand conspiracy against it. Where you do see people paying a lot of attention to Tom, Thomas these days is actually in, in Protestant circles, where they figured that they figured out that they left a lot behind when they they condemned him as like being the official Catholic philosopher, which he never was. Um, he was he was never the one single approved philosopher for for Catholics. So um, that's that's probably enough about Thomism. Auntie, what are some of your favorite contemporary philosophical sci-fi writers? That is tough for me to say because I don't read a lot of contemporary sci-fi. If you mean like stuff that's been published in the last 10 years. And I don't know who's philosophical and who isn't. I spend a lot of my time reading stuff that's much earlier, you know, up to like the 70s and 80s. Um, so I don't, I don't really have a good answer to, to that. I mean, if you're, if you ask me about fantasy, I can give you a little better answer. Cause I've read R. Scott Backer, you know, um, I mean, when it comes to sci-fi, I could say, okay, I read Octavia Butler. Could she be considered contemporary? I guess so. You know, uh, and I liked her stuff and it's, it's quite philosophical, but I, I, I'm not, I'm not reading a lot of new stuff these days. So. You know, um, IDK, what do you think about the argument that stoicism leads to support for the status quo? I think it's bullshit. I think that anybody who, I mean, you, you notice that you wrote stoicism with a lowercase s, actual stoicism, uppercase s, you know, if you read it, it answers the question for you. If you think about the key people involved in it, was um, Musonius Rufus just supporting the status quo? Was Epictetus saying just support the status quo? I mean, read the discourses. Within uh, the very first two of the discourses, you've got a guy who's opposing the emperor and saying, "Well, you can kill me, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the Senate and say what I have to say." Um, Stoics took part in all sorts of operations. So this notion that it means just supporting the status quo, that's not stoicism. That's some sort of caricature of stoicism. And you got to ask, what's the agenda of the person who's making these claims? Are they just stupid, lazy, they ignorant? Because those are the only like ways that you get them out of like deliberately um, putting a, a fake picture forward, right? So yeah, I don't I don't buy it. Um I mean, I'll say plenty of fake stoicism, and and there is a lot of stuff that I'm I'm willing to call fake stoicism, uh, which is you know the people who are selling coaching packages, and they actually they put all sorts of quotes out there, some of which aren't even by the people that they're they're quoting, and they get Epictetus's picture mixed up mixed up with Epicurus's because they don't know shit, right? And they're just trying to capitalize on stoicism. That sort of stuff is probably just going to be about, you know, the status quo, although they want to make their way into the status quo and make some money. Right? But real stoicism, no, it's, it's, it's definitely not just about supporting the status quo. I mean, if the status quo is a fair, just, wise status quo, yes. How often is that the case? Not very. Right? Um, all right, Jared, what do you think Democritus' justification was for motion since he considered motion as not having to be explained? Not a clue. I, I, you know, I think that when it comes to these these thinkers, these pre-Socratic thinkers, who we don't have their texts and we only have you know fragments at best, um, we we probably shouldn't try to read too much in there and and place our own ideas about that into their their texts. So, um, Max Montague, what's your opinion on people trying to shoehorn in Kant as a deontologist? Especially since I heard that some Kant scholars are challenging that description of his ethics. I mean, Kant is as deontological as you can get. <laughs> so you can always find some scholars who are challenging anything, but who gives a shit? You know, the mainstream of scholarship on Kant considers him to be 
not just a deontologist, but one of the deontologists, you know, who is like the the paradigm of the the very idea, right? So, I mean, that that one seems to be kind of a non-starter to me. Uh, James Carlyle, do you prefer the U.S. or European PHC system for philosophy? A longer one with classwork versus a shorter one with just a dissertation. I don't prefer either because I'm not in charge of that. You know, <laughs> so um, here I'll, I'll tell you what my take is. I think that if you have the opportunity to spend a lot of time on doing coursework with people who are very invested in, you know, competent uh, presentation and analysis of core texts in the history of philosophy, you would be silly to not take advantage of that, wouldn't you? I mean, when I was in graduate school, I took way more classes than I actually had to. And I didn't just take classes with the philosophy department. I took them with the classics department, the English department, the speech communications department. Why wouldn't you want to do as much coursework as you can get? I mean, I even took coursework as um, somebody who had a PhD. When, when my wife was studying at European graduate school, in uh, Sasfe, Switzerland, and I went over there to visit her and they made me a visiting scholar. They said, you can take a class for free. And I was like, oh, that sounds cool. I'm taking a class on Schopenhauer with, with Wolfgang Schirmacher because I never had a Schopenhauer class. And this guy is the president of the International Schopenhauerian Society and the, the head of the school. So presumably he, he, he's, you know, he knows some stuff. Why wouldn't you take classes if you have the opportunity to take them with people that are good why wouldn't you do that? You know? Um, now, on the other hand, if your teachers suck, <laughs> it's not much good taking classes, right? If they're a bunch of uh, you have to do things exactly my way kind of jerks, eh, maybe you just write the dissertation then, right? But I, I don't think that, that there's an overall this is better, this is worse thing. Maybe some people don't want to take classes, you know, and they just want to write their dissertation. Um, they're, both, they're both fine to do, right? All right, uh, Majeo, do you think the shift from society as a discipline to society as control that Deleuze makes drawing from Foucault unwarranted? I mean, I think any of these big picture, this to this paradigm stuff, we always got to be kind of careful about, right? So, you know, these things often turn into slogans. Justin, was Friedrich Nietzsche an atheist? Are you going to do any more self-directed study videos? Yeah, I'm going to do self-directed study videos down the line when I have the time. Was Friedrich Nietzsche an atheist? Yeah, he was an atheist. Um, I mean, depending on what your sense of atheism means. Um, he talks sometimes about divinities, but it's definitely not like, you know, the idea of uh, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. But, uh, you know, I mean, who these questions about is this person an atheist? Is that person an atheist? Who gives a shit? You know? <laughs> How is that? How is that particularly relevant to understanding their their philosophy and its key themes? You know, um, R. What is your opinion about this? Must be Pyrrhonism. Yeah, Sextus's arguments are still relevant in a sense. There's a strong Aristotelian view, like Aristotelianism, criticism, Nietzscheanism. I don't know what criticism is supposed to mean because um, that isn't that isn't a a strong philosophical view or tradition. And I don't think there is anything like Nietzscheanism. There, and Aristotelianism is a very broad spectrum, so I'm not sure what the connection is here. But what's your opinion about Pyrrhonism? Uh, you know, it's it's a very extreme kind of skepticism. Um, if I was going to be a skeptic, I'd probably be much more of a Ciceronian skeptic, you know, attracted to the, or, you know, a Humean type of skeptic. Um, Actually, Hume has, has some good essays on that, that sort of thing, why the hardcore skepticism is kind of self-refuting and, and problematic. So, um, And by the way, you can, be, you can certainly be skeptical in the lower you know, case sense uh, of philosophical perspectives you know, in the sense that you want evidence for them, you don't buy into them automatically without going into skepticism right, uh, of one form or another. All right. Um, uh, just skipped a little bit. Let's see where we were. Um, <clears throat> man, 
things are kind of jumping around. Do, do, do. Um, okay, Francisco's got a good question here. I think I have to scroll up a bit more, but I'll take this one right here. If you want to understand a philosophical text, could secondary literature properly replace lectures and discussions with your peers? I mean, if if you have to, I mean, sure. Secondary literature, if you're using it right, is you having a conversation with the author about the other author who is the primary thinker. Um, why wouldn't you use as much as you can? Why, why would you turn it into an either or though? So, um, all right, I scrolled back up to get to where I was. Uh, Drac and thoughts on justice and Plato's Republic compared to Dante's Inferno. Um, I mean, it's two, that's apples to oranges or actually apples to steaks or something like that. Um, Dante's Inferno, which is part of the Divine Comedy, right, is part of how it's ex sort of explaining how people are getting what they deserve. I mean, the only little connection between the two, I, I guess, is like the myth of uh, that that's in the end of the, the Republic about the transmigrations. Right. So I, I don't see that as um, a way to compare them. Um, Venner says. What do you think about intelligence and spirit? I've never read it, so I, I can't say anything. Um, Novan, would you please describe Big Alien point of view about nothing and being and God as the problem of the beginning? No, I'm going to pass on that because I'm not even, I'm not even sure how I would start that. Um, sometimes the, the questions people are asking for here in an AMA are like, you know, uh, stuff that you would have to take a whole session to unpack and you don't have the text in front of you. Um, a doesn't equal A. Someone's making polished renderings out of your half hour Hegel series chalkboard diagrams. They'll probably be available at the Marxist think tank website. Well, that's cool. And, and, and if somebody wants to forward them to me. I would love that. Um, I don't envy the person <laughs> who is doing it because trying to read my my shitty writing, I, I've never had good penmanship. And I mean, you see the chalkboard behind me. Um, it's just gotten worse and worse and worse the older that I've got. I, I've actually got got a, a problem with my hands, unfortunately. This, like, I, I, it's a genetic thing. This muscle in here or tendons or whatever get very tight. And uh, eventually I'm probably going to lose some control, some motor control over my hands. And they hurt sometimes. Um, and, you know, I can, I can, get massage done on them and stuff like that. But even my incredibly great body worker who we're, we're so fortunate to have reaches limits and she's like, this is the best it's going to get. So my writing is terrible, <laughs> but yeah, that's really cool that people are, are doing that. I'm kind of, kind of happy to see that. Um, even says, I'm wondering if you'd share a little bit about your writing process. How do you take your ideas and put them into words systematically? I don't, I don't have a writing process. I just, you know, it's sort of like asking a fish, how do you swim? I don't know. I, I just, I just do it. <laughs> I, I, you know, and so asking somebody like me is not very helpful. Um, asking, you know, for somebody like my wife, Andy Shaka, who's, who's a writing instructor would probably be a lot more helpful. Um, but I, I don't, I, unfortunately, I don't have any guidance for that. Um, Med says, I just finished reading the Ion of Plato's Dialogues. What next now? The Mino, the Euthyphro, the Credo, the Apology, the Phaedo. Those, those, those are usually the six that I start people with. And then where you go from there, it's up to you. Do you, do you like rhetoric? Read the Gorgias and the Phaedrus. Do you, are you into um, you know, talks about love and stuff? Well, read the Lysias about friendship and then the Symposium and then the Phaedrus. Um, you know, it, it all depends on what your, your interests are. You, you, and there's no like one single course you have to go through for reading, um, Plato. So, uh, Senita, do you think that we need a contemporary Kant-like figure to once again, close the gap between Anglo-Saxon analytic and continental philosophy? No, 
I think that's silly because who gives a shit about that gap? I mean, continental philosophy isn't just one thing. It's a whole bunch of traditions. Analytic philosophy is now in post-analytic philosophy where it's lost its roots and its historical figures. And you've got all these different people doing their own thing. And they're not the only game in town, right? Um, this all, all this like bridging the analytic continental gap. So many people have done that already. Habermas does it. Ricoeur does it. You know, uh, John Wisdom was doing it back in the 40s. But what about classical American philosophy, which isn't just pragmatism, by the way, but also includes the transcendentalists and the St. Louis Hegelians and, and, and. What about the radical philosophy traditions? What about comparative philosophy? What about the Thomists, you know, and other uh, uh, committed um you know, uh, religious uh, philosophies. What about philosophy as a way of life? All of these are just as legitimate as continental and analytic philosophy. And do we need some some person to unite the two? I mean, did Kant actually do that with empiricism and rationalism? Anybody who's told you that they they did is is telling an old story that was you know bullshit back then. Uh, it's a it's a cool little story, but that's like you know fairy tales, you know, as far as the history of philosophy goes. Um, do we need somebody like, like that today? Why would we need that? You know, I, I that's just kind of a non-starter for me. Um, Draken, have you played Magic the Gathering? No, but I've watched a lot of people do it and en enough to know that I have no interest in it whatsoever. <laughs> um, OSH, when you did math major, what was the most difficult math course and why Galois theory? We didn't have a class on Galois theory. Um, and you should know that there isn't like a set math curriculum that everybody has in every single school across the board. Um, I mean, the most difficult one I would say was probably either, you know, Calc 3 or complex analysis. Um, but the most fun one was a seminar that we spent an entire semester on going through um, Douglas, Hof Douglas Hofstadter's Gerdel Escher Bach and Eternal Golden Braid. That was a lot of fun. Um, Francisco, do you think that philosophy is like math or chess in the sense that to become proficient, it's necessary to start young? No, I, I don't. I don't think so at all. And you know, um, why would that be the case? You know, people people have come to philosophy very late in life and made some really significant contributions. So the the history doesn't even bear that out. Um, Let's see. Oh, Paul asked, do I have any thoughts about the new Dune movie? I talked about that a little bit. I thought it was pretty good. You know, I was I was prepared to not like it because <laughs> there hasn't been a, a really good Dune movie or miniseries. But I, I thought it was pretty good. I enjoyed it. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, it, it continues on as a franchise. And I can't say that about a lot of franchises. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah. Um, Kartik, I'm too intimidated to start to start studying philosophy on my own. How can I? You know, I think I actually uh, did a video about that a while back um, about people who are intimidated to read. Um, you should think about why you're intimidated and whether you actually have good reasons for it. And then, you know, get yourself to jump in. It's sort of like learning how to swim. You got to get in the water sooner or later or decide you're just not going to not going to swim. Right. Um, Darth Vader, what do you think Kant would have thought of Hegel building upon his work? I mean, did Hegel build upon Kant's work? I, I don't see it that way. Fichte maybe, but I don't know that Hegel is building on Kant's work. I think Hegel is kind of doing his own thing, um, using some ideas that come from this broad movement of German idealism that Kant is a really important early figure in. But Man, does Hegel draw on a lot of different resources? So, yeah. Um, NL and NL is clearly Oedipalized or you know has some wish fulfillment going on there. The mom was peeking at her son's abs, no doubt. I mean, that's one of like thirty interpretations that you could have come up with. It probably says more about you than it does about the movie, right? So. Uh, let's see here. Darth Vader, could you tell us about Pinker being a schmuck 
those who aren't from the West are ignorant because isn't he like the guy who keep, keeps blatantly saying things like everything is better and so on. Yeah, I mean, Pinker, so Pinker does a couple different things, right? He, he's a popularizer. He's a popular writer. His stuff is, you know, sort of a mixture of stuff that can be good and stuff that's that's crap, right? And he he's all about, like, you know, the importance of engaging critics, but then he doesn't engage critics, right? Um, and that's, you know, I mean, we could go into other stuff like his unsavory friendships and all that. I mean, he's he's essentially part of an elite who was in the right place at the right time with the right face and the right contacts and made it big and thinks that he knows better than than other people. And, um, you know, some people do know better than other people, but I wouldn't bet that it's Steven Pinker. <laughs> so, you know, that makes him a schmuck. Um, I think that's probably easy enough. Um, Boki, have you read uh, Ilyenkov? I have not read Ilyenkov. Um, all right, let's see here. Um, a lot of people asking about people I've never, I've never read. So, um, Darth Vader, what do you think is the overlap between psychoanalysis and philosophy? Um, do you, do you think psychoanalysis like philosophy starts from a phenomenological point of view without any presuppositions? Find me a philosopher who ever began without any presuppositions and what we could have that conversation then. And you're never going to find one because they, they don't exist. Um, philosophy doesn't always start from a phenomenological point of view. Phil the phenomenological points of view are one tool that philosophy has. There are many different starting places for philosophy. What do you think is the overlap between psychoanalysis and philosophy? Which psychoanalyst are you talking about? Which philosophy are you talking about? Those are all things that you'd have to clarify. Um, Blaze, do you find Zizek's incorporation of psychoanalysis into German idealism useful for your understanding of Hegel? I do not. Um, I find reading Hegel helpful for my understanding of Hegel. That is that is the basis that I come back to over and over and over again. Um, I you know I will read secondary literature on Hegel every once in a while, which sometimes I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, that's a good point. There is nobody who's like take on Hegel. I think is determinative for understanding Hegel. Just like you know, if you want to understand Aristotle read Aristotle. If you want to understand what Camus is saying, read Camus. Secondary lit can be helpful and it can often be quite interesting but and insightful, but it's not, it's not, there's no key to reading a primary text other than reading that primary text, I think, you know. Uh, GBTG, I think it's fair to say Dr. Sadler does not abide mindfulness. I mean, if you got that from my, you know, five minute talk on it, you, you weren't paying attention. I super clear woo woo, you know, new agey mindfulness all by itself. That's garbage. You know, mindfulness as a substitute for actually providing people with psychotherapy that they need. That's garbage too. Mindfulness within a context. That's not garbage. That's actually quite helpful. Um, so, you know, I think people got to avoid these very extreme, you know, it's this way or it's this way sort of thing and develop some like nuance that that's, if you want to be a philosopher, you got to be able to say, well, yes, but also no, if we understand it this way, distinctions are, you know, the, the, probably the most important skill that we philosophers bring to the table is the ability to make needed distinctions and to do so well. You know, when I'm doing work with clients, you know, who are not trained philosophers, it's as if they think that we're magic because we can do that. You know, it's not all the memorization of concepts and having read through primary text. That's all great. That's useful being able to thoughtfully make distinctions and not have a one-sided point of view is massively important, right? So, yeah. All right. Um, let me scroll down. There's people talking about eternal recurrence. Uh, Darth Vader says, would love to see you talk Hegel with Zizek. Would you ever be open to discuss philosophy and theology with Zizek someday. You know, people ask me these sort of things. And I think what they don't understand is 
this is kind of a nice pipe dream. If you want to make it happen, then ask me after you've got Zizek on the line. And, you know, then, it, then it's a live possibility. The idea that these people up in the stratosphere of celebrity are going to engage with people down here like me is kind of kind of silly, you know. Um, they don't do that. They engage with other people uh, up there on top. Um, I mean, I could possibly, if I went back to to EGS, you know, run into to Zizek somewhere, and then he'd he'd treat me like the uh, uh, you know. I mean, he he treats his students like like crap. You've read about him and his you know don't send me your shitty papers. What makes you think he'd want to talk to somebody like me? You know, um, I mean, obviously if, if he wanted to do it and somebody set it up, sure. I'd be game for that. Um, but in what universe is that ever going to happen? <laughs> you know? So yeah. Um, all right. looks like, uh, we got some, some goofy stuff here. So I got to. uh, take care of, of, of uh, one of the people who's spamming the, the thing. All right. Um, let's see what else we have. Um, Paul asks, I've read that all we know about Socrates is written by Plato. So that's false. Uh, wherever you read that, they, they are selling you a line. Is it possible that Socrates was a fictional character created by Plato to explain his philosophical ideas? So this is basically the mythicist thing applied to Socrates. If you don't know what mythicism is, it's this crazy notion that there never was a Jesus guy. It was all made up. No. I mean, do we, do, first of all, who do we know about Socrates through? Well, um, Plato and Xenophon and through other, you know, uh, lineages as well. So there, there isn't anybody in ancient times who's like, you know, I think maybe maybe Socrates is just made up or something. So whatever source you got that from, you want to quit listening to them, I think, or start looking at them with, uh, with a very critical lens. Um, we know a lot about Socrates, you know, and, and we, we know enough about him to know that he made a massive I impression and influence on people that could lead to different pictures of Socrates. You know, Xenophon's picture of Socrates is not the same thing as Plato's picture of Socrates. And then the other ones that sort of come through other sources, which, which presumably are fairly reliable, are highlighting other aspects of this guy, Socrates. So... All right, Marx has been thinking about techne as uh, excellence lately. Any discussions of techne by contemporary virtue ethicists you recommend? That's a good question. Um, I mean, nothing like pops into my head uh, as like a study of Aristotelian understandings of techne as, as such. Um, I mean, there are fragmentary stuff within the Stoic thing, but there's there's not, you know, in the, in the ancient uh, stuff, there's there, it's like techne often gets de-emphasized quite a bit, I suppose, except by the people who are doing technes, like rhetoricians. You know, rhetoric was considered a techne. So maybe we want to look at people that are saying something about Lysias or, or um, you know, Cicero's a, a good person for, for that. But no, I, yeah, unfortunately, nothing nothing really comes to mind. Um, but I'm not reading a lot of contemporary virtue ethics stuff either these days, you know. Um, all right, uh, Cork Mars, what do you think of the Carmides and the meaning of Sophrosyne? So the Carmides is a uh, early dialogue by Plato. They're trying to figure out what Sophrosyne or temperance means, and it's an aporetic dialogue. So it, you know, it's kind of like all over the map, and and they uh, can't figure out a proper. Um, solution of, of what what things are, but they, they go some interesting places along the way. They kind of show us that the idea of there being a knowledge of knowledge isn't quite going to work. Um, so it's it's Plato playing around with, with some ideas. He, you know, I think if you want to find out what Plato really thinks about temperance, the place to go is the Republic, right? Uh, where there's, there's discussion of it in primarily uh, books um, two through through four. So... 
Jaden Watson says, uh, do I have any thoughts on the Dao? Um, which Dao are you talking about? I mean, the Dao of Taoism or the many other ways in which people have invoked that, you know, with like C.S. Lewis talking about there being a Dao lying behind things. I mean, it's, it's one of those uh, important concepts when we're actually looking into Taoism that we have to like, like, go to the primary text and see what they say. And much of what they say is paradoxical. Um, do I think there's anything myself like what, what the Taoists call the Tao? Um, you can't even say really underlying reality, but encompassing all reality. I don't. I, I don't think that, that there is... Um, any, any more than I think that there's a logos that pervades everything, you know, the way that, that some of the ancient Stoics did, right? Um, so, yeah. Um, scroll down a bit. Irony says, for Hegel, you say to start with easier works before the phenomenology of spirit. Where do you recommend you start? Is it necessary to read Kant to understand Hegel? I'll, I'll say it this way. Can't hurt. Can't hurt to read Aristotle to understand Hegel, right? There's a lot of people that it, it would be useful to read before reading Hegel. Um, Kant is not absolutely central in, in importance. Reading Rousseau would probably be very helpful as well. Um, I recommend reading the lectures on the history of philosophy because then you can get like Hegel's take on what philosophy is about and how it developed and reading the lectures on the philosophy of history. Those are my two go-tos. Uh, and I make this recommendation a lot when people are are asking that sort of question. Um, I mean, you could read other things by Hegel. There's earlier works. <clears throat> you know, there's also Reason in History, which gives you a little bit of his his uh, uh, system, you could say. But I, I think those two are the, the best. Uh, Darth Vader, which tradition school of philosophy other than Stoicism aligns with your personal values and lifestyle? I did a whole video on how I'm a Ciceronian eclectic uh, a while back. Um, so obviously Ciceronian eclecticism, which is not a system, but is sort of an attitude. Um, you know, I draw heavily on Aristotle. I draw heavily on the, the Platonist tradition, which includes not just Plato, but the middle Platonists like Plutarch and, you know, Neoplatonists going all the way into Christian Neoplatonism. Draw heavily on the existentialists. I draw heavily on dialectical philosophy. Um, you know, there's, there's a number of, <clears throat> number of different sources that I'm pulling from. I like some things in Descartes. I like some things in Pascal. I even like some things in Hume. You know? <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of different traditions and schools of philosophy that, that I draw on. But if, you, if I had to describe my overall attitude, you know, I would say that sort of like Alistair McIntyre, I'm a virtue ethicist and I understand virtue ethics as not just like a, you know, a system that can be reduced to axioms the way that crazy people try to do with it, where it's really a weird kind of code. It's more like, you know, what he calls tradition constituted rationality, this vast conversation that we participate in and try to make sense out of our, our lives and our, our obligations and relationships through and then we, we draw upon, you know, whoever's got something valuable. So, you know, McIntyre in, in uh, some of his essays will say, here's what we need to draw on from John Stuart Mill. Here's what we need to take from Kant, you know. Um, so that, that's kind of my, my point of view. And that, I think that is rather Ciceronian if you look at how Cicero himself works out his, his philosophy. All right, Craig says, do I have a recommendation for learning contemporary philosophy of 20th century? For example, contemporaries, Edmund Husserl, Simone de Beauvoir, Ayn Rand, Badiou, Chomsky. Um, so those, those, a lot of them are not 21st century philosophers, right? Um, Husserl died a long time ago. De Beauvoir lived past that into the 80s, but she's long dead. Ayn Rand is long dead. Um, Badiou and Chomsky are around, but they're both old, old guys, right? Uh, probably about as old as McIntyre, um, who's, I think, 93 now. Um, do I have recommendations for learning contemporary philosophy? Yeah, and, and my recommendations, I think the thing I would start with at the, at the very beginning is, you know, read their books, but don't read them as, as like a joiner, a believer, you know, don't become a Badiouian. Read what Badiou has to say. 
Uh, because before you're really going to get what he's saying, you're going to have to do some backstory stuff and and read, you know, going back before the 20th century because these people are referencing, you know, for example, Plato. Um, I, I think that you do you have to read all of Plato's works before you can read any contemporary stuff? No, no. Um, but you do need to know some things about what Plato actually thought. So when they talk about Platonism, you're not, you know, you're not at sea. Like, it, it, you know, there was, there's a lot of crit criticism of Platonism in 20th century European philosophy. Um, and there's also some endorsement. I mean, Iris Murdoch, right? Um, great 20th century novelist and philosopher. Um, so, you know, reading, reading the backstory stuff, um, and, and, and not, not reading it in the way where the, the people in the present who are criticizing it sour your, your reading of it. So like when you read Descartes, for example, you want to read Descartes and take seriously the idea that somebody could think these thoughts and they're not just crazy and they're not, you know, just a representative of modernity and it's iron cage of rationality. You want to like read them and, and you know, be sympathetic to them, and and not everybody has to be all right at the same time. You know, you, you couldn't do that unless you were containing multitudes in a Whitman kind of way. Um, but that will enrich your understanding of the the contemporary thinkers. So Chomsky, for example, Chomsky endorses a kind of uh, Cartesian based thing when it comes to to language having to do with innate ideas. You know, um, and then. The other thing I would say that's important, you can't read everybody. So you don't have to feel as if you have to find all of the important 20th and 21st century thinkers and read through them all. That, that's just not feasible. Um, probably can't even do that with the important thinkers of the 19th century. Uh, there's a lot of them too. So you got to you got to be selective, you know, you you decide where you want to put your time and attention. And it may be that there's some philosophers who um aren't as rewarding for you. And that's okay, you know. So I am working uh through varieties of religious experience with one of my clients um who, you know, decided he wanted to work on that book. And we meet every two weeks and we go through some of the chapters. I have another client who tried to read the varieties of religious experience on his own and found that he just couldn't accept it. And this is a guy who does work in religious studies. And he's like, I, I can't read this crap, right? Now, it's the same book, right? Different readers are coming to it with different things. So, you know, if you're reading, um, I mean, Husserl is very boring but worth reading in parts. Um, he's an interesting guy, introduces some good ideas, but you know, Jeremy Bentham is also very boring to read unless, unless you really get into it, right? Um, but well worth doing. Simone de Beauvoir is a lot more fun. Um, I think William James is, is a lot of fun myself, um, but some people don't like him. So as you're approaching these things, you can, you can look at it um, as these are opportunities for you to engage with an author, see what they have to say. You don't have to buy into everything that they're saying. You know, um, there's there's always going to be some things that you find implausible or you know maybe even offensive. It kind of goes back to that comment earlier about about where where the guy was saying, you know, Plato says this, and I can't accept that he he says this about justice. And somebody who says that about justice, he must be wrong about everything else. Well, no, no. Um, you can kind of pick and choose. You 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 don't have to accept everything that an author says. You can take some useful things from it. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll say as well, because I don't want to spend you know too much time on this, um, books, classic books, reward rereading. What does that mean? Well, great works of literature, like again, varieties of religious experience, or you know, I'm, I'm kind of too bad I, I don't have other books lined up over here that I can do that with. Um, you're going to find things that you missed the first time around. And actually, you know, I will, I do have another book. So I reviewed recently this book by Elliot Rosenstock, The Ego and Its Hyperstate. Very thin book, right? 
came out from Zero Books just this last week. And um, the first time that I read it, in order to do a Sadler's Honest review, this is also, by the way, a book that's you know psychoanal psychoanalytically psychoanalytically informed dialectical analysis. A lot of a lot of continental jargon kind of stuff involved there, right? Um, the first time I read it, I was like, yeah, I don't. I, I think some of these things don't actually work together. I'm not that happy with the book. The second time I reread it, I was like, oh, now I see how the parts fit. Okay, this this is actually a pretty good book. So there's a lot of things like that, you know, as you're reading, say, Husserl or Badiou or Chomsky, where that's going to happen for you, right? Um, and sometimes you you got to put the book down and go do something else for an hour, a day, a week, a month, and then come back to it, and you'll you'll get something different out of the book as a result. Um, I, and maybe one other thing, try to look for resources that are out there. Um, there was a you know, a question earlier about reading secondary literature versus like going to videos and stuff like that. Use it all, you know. Um, if, if you find that there's somebody out there, I, I don't, you know, watch a lot of other people's videos because taking the time to produce videos cuts into my day. Um, but if there's somebody out there who explains Badiou very well, watch their videos or read their blog posts or get their books or things like that. Um, I mean, with Badiou or Chomsky, you could also write to them. They may not respond to you, <laughs> but they are still alive and you could talk to them. Whereas Simone de Beauvoir, she's dead. You're never going to get an answer out of her, right? Or, or Edmund Husserl or, or any other um, past philosopher like that. So hopefully that's, that's, that's useful for you. Um, oh, we're getting close to the end of the hour and I've got another event coming up uh, later on. Let me see if I can take some, some questions about, uh, there from other people that I haven't gotten anything from. Um, do, do, do. <laughs> Here's a funny name. Darth Vegan. What would your entrance music be if you met Evil Sandler in a WWE match? Well, there, there is some entrance. There's a song that I would like to be my entrance music no matter what. If, if I ever got, you know, the rights to use it, I would like to walk out to Zero the Hero, you know, by Black Sabbath. Uh, it's a great song, great riff, and um, I like the lyrics. So, yeah. Uh, Dylan, are you interested in the writings that come from Theravada Buddhism? I mean, the texts that conform to the Pali Canon, the uh, Nikayas, et cetera. Yeah, I'm interested in them. I don't have as much time to, to read um, stuff like that. And obviously, I have to read it in translation because I don't, I don't read um, the languages that they're written in. So, yeah. Um, Raul says, would you say there is a shift for the worse in Foucault's later life, specifically when he talks about practices of the self, care of the self, and notion of parasia? I don't think it's a shift for the worse. I think there is definitely a shift there. I, I think, on the one hand, Foucault plays fast and loose with the ancient texts and thinkers that he's using, right? So don't rely on him as a faithful interpreter of ancient philosophy, um, but on the other hand, there's some interesting stuff that he is he is drawing to our attention. And I kind of like that stuff. I mean, if I have to choose between the history of sexuality and the order of things, the order of things is going away, even though it's a really cool book. You know, it's probably his most structuralist book, by the way. Um, so, yeah, there, there is definitely a shift. And Foucault himself says that there's there's a shift going on. Um Gerda Damerung says, what are some problems you see with Foucault's ideas? You said before you doubt he will be read much in the future. I've actually said the opposite. I think that Derrida won't be read much in the future, but that Foucault will. Um, you know, some of the problems with Foucault's ideas, I just signaled one. Um, his, his use of historical texts and thinkers is, is often quite suspect, especially if you know the stuff that he's talking about. You know, I'm not a criminologist, but I have quite a few criminologist friends. And when they look at, you know, um, the birth of the prison, they're uh, in discipline and punish. They're often like, 
Um, yeah, some of this story is true, but eh, some of it isn't. So there's, you know, like with any anybody who's doing historical interpretation, there's there's some places where the narrative might not really be as as cut and dried as Foucault makes it out to be. Um, I mean, obviously, getting himself sick and dying and cutting short his life was a foolish thing on his part if he really had a big project that he was working on. So that's that's kind of a, an issue, right? Um, all right, let me scroll down here, see who else we haven't gotten to before. Um, <laughs> Tom McDowell says Bentham is so turgid. If you can struggle through it, there's some excellent dry wit in his later work. There is actually, actually, even even in his early work, there's there's a lot of good dry wit. Um, but he loves these endless lists of things, and and you can say, why does he do that? Well, he's he's trying to use lists as part of an argument to show I've covered everything that could be covered. It's it's a way of saying I'm I'm being comprehensive, you know. So, um, all right. Uh, Mohammed says, what do you think of Mach Stirner and the young Hegelians of his time? Do you think they took Hegel in an interesting direction? I mean, I don't think they took Hegel in an interesting direction. I think they took Hegelian ideas and language in an interesting direction. Um, Stirner is, is, you know, I, I, I enjoy reading his stuff. Uh, someday I may do videos about it. I actually have thumbnails that I made a long time ago when I was working with a client on uh, going through um, uh, the uh, ego and, and its own, the ego and its property. <clears throat> but um, I don't know. I, I think Stirner is kind of a dead end, frankly, uh, unless you just want to be an egoist like that. Um, so, you know, it's uh, there's a lot of cool stuff happening in – I guess you could call it Hegelian slash post-Hegelian philosophy. Um, you know, Feuerbach is really cool to read. I think that he articulates Hegel's views on religion particularly well and calls out what's what's really happening there. I think Feuerbach is a faithful interpreter of Hegel in that respect. Um, obviously, Marx, you know, there's all these other Hegelians that are more obscure that are that are fun to read. So um, Sam asks, what is the crux of the disagreement between Deleuzians and Hegelians? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know that there is actually a, um, coherent group out there that we would call the Hegelians that get to speak on the part of Hegel. Um, I mean, if it has to do with like the, the, you know, historical developments, Hegel obviously was wrong about a lot of stuff. Um, and Deleuzians seem to be all over the map, you know. I, I'm not sure that there's any coherent Deleuzian movement there, so I, I don't really know. It's a good question. Um, Michael asks as well, aside from After Virtue, what do you think is Alistair McIntyre's most important single piece of written work? <clears throat> I don't. I, I would say that After Virtue is... Um, You know, if you think about the, the four book series, Whose Justice, Which Rationality is probably more important than After Virtue. More important in the sense of like the ideas are being worked out more fully there. And then you could see Dependent Rational Animals and um, Three Rival Versions as like amplifications of that. Um, unfortunately, After Virtue is the one that everybody reads. But I think you can see after virtue as like something flowing into the much, much more robust um, who's justice, which rationality, you know? So, yeah. And, and, and I think it's good if, you, if you're really interested in McIntyre as a thinker, you do want to read his stuff before after virtue, like his history of ethics is, is quite, quite interesting um, and often quite good. Um, against the self images of the age, you know, those, those sorts of things are all quite, quite interesting to check out. Um, so yeah, those, those are all, those are all quite good. Um, now Ray points something out that's kind of interesting here. Deleuze is already totemic 
and on the same level as Foucault. Yeah, I, I think that a lot of these thinkers like Deleuze, with or without Qatari, Spinoza, Hegel, um, Marx also, um, they are they they function in that's a good word, totemic. People identify with them and it's part of like their team. And they they get some ideas about like what Hegel is actually saying, but they don't they don't spend a lot of time systematically studying Hegel. And I think that a lot of people who talk about Deleuze are not really systematically working their way through Deleuze's stuff and Deleuze's stuff with Guattari. They're kind of picking and choosing the things that look cool. So then they pick up on on terminology like the body without organs hey, everything's a body without organs well the body with or without organs i think is an incoherent idea quite frankly it's something that sounds really cool but but uh, you know i've read Deleuze, and um i if you ask me what the hell it is there's a, a whole bunch of different answers and that's not satisfying to somebody like like me right and i think that you can say there's similar things about hegel right um, you can talk all you want about determinate negation or the negation of the negation. And that can mean anything you want it to mean. It becomes this, it's almost like a, a consumer product, right? And we exchange it among ourselves. And that's not, that's not doing real theory or philosophy, I would say. Um, all right, let me scroll. Let me take a couple more minutes. I got I to gotta get some lunch before I hold my next thing, but I want to see if there's some other good um things i can i can pick up on from from other people here um let's see here so jordan says i know a philosopher who's good friends with zizek and he knows doc who's dr sadler is i think it's very possible to set up so yeah if you want to do that <laughs> be my guest um let's see let's hear tarzan give us three movie recommendations okay now that's easier than than saying what's your favorite movie so you know i would say you know there's all these great adaptations of philip k dick stories and novels like Scanner Darkly. I, I think Scanner Darkly was a pretty good adaptation. Now, you got to like Rotoscope. My, my wife won't watch it because she it makes her sick to watch Rotoscope, which is unfortunate. Um, I, I mentioned Memento earlier. I used Memento quite a bit in classes when I was teaching. I, you know, back in the time when it was really cool to talk about Descartes and the evil demon and... Um, the Matrix, I didn't show The Matrix. I would show Dark City instead, which is a lot more fun, I think, <clears throat> than The Matrix. Um, and, you know, I, I like a lot of older, you know, like neo-noir movies. I, I get into that sort of stuff um, as well. Um, i trying to think if there's anything that's really, really impressed me lately. Um Nothing really comes to mind. Oh, now here's a great question. Um, Captain of the Nerd Guard, what do you think about the creeping nihilism that is occurring in cartoons nowadays, like in Adventure Time? So I haven't watched Adventure Time for a long time because my kids used to watch it when they were young and then they kind of grew out of it. But there's a lot of cartoons where you can say there's, it's, I don't know if it's nihilism as such. But there's there's this, and and it's it's not just in cartoons; it's also in some live action shows. It's like absurdism, uh, you know, happening over and over and over again. I mean, there is also the this is this is something that would actually be worth talking about at, at considerable length. You know, doing a, a sort of media analysis. There's also this sort of like we didn't learn any lessons. Um, great example of a show where that happens all the time is Always Sunny in Philadelphia, which is a show I love, you know, and I love it because I actually enjoy that sort of comedy. <clears throat> My wife has a more limited tolerance for that. Um, but the like people acting, you know, in, in weird or, or screwed up or obsessive ways and things happen, but there's really no there's really no resolution that runs through things. Um, yeah, there is that in a lot of cartoons, um, more when they're oriented towards adults, 
less for kids, I would say. Um, but a lot of cartoons are hitting things on two levels, right? Like, you know, when my, when my daughter was obsessed with Kim Possible, I enjoyed watching Kim Possible uh, a good bit because it was also good for, for adults. I'll, I'll also admit, too, that, you know, I knew uh, Nicole Sullivan from Mad TV era and her portrayal of Shigo was, was quite fun as well. So there's like a familiarity effect too to that. But yeah, I mean, there, there, there is a, 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 I don't know if we have to call it nihilism as such, but there's definitely a, a undermining of traditional narratives, which might've been all bullshit too, um, going on within comedy media. Um, and it opens up the door to other things happening. You know, I, I just watched my way through this British show zapped, which is about a guy who's an office kind of drone and he gets, he gets transported. He's actually a courier. Yeah. He gets transported into another dimension. It's kind of like a fantasy thing. There's some cool characters and nothing really works in the end, but there's some really great, storylines and <clears throat> there's the opportunity for relationships to develop and um, for, you know, tenderness sometimes to be shown towards people or, or, you know, there's just because things happen in a universe that doesn't have an automatic making sense narrative to it doesn't mean that everything becomes meaningless. It means you have to work for it. I mean, this is sort of the existential, we could say the, that there, there's a, I'll, I'll, I'll end on this. Maybe there's a tension between a kind of nihilist and an existentialist motif in both of these that's different than it would have been if it was done in 1940. You know, we're living in a, in a much more complex world, both in terms of economics and um, culture and media and, and all of that sort of stuff. So... All right, so I think that's a good thing to end on. Um, I got 20 minutes to shove some food in my face before I got to get on to my next thing. Thanks to everybody for showing up. Uh, I've enjoyed this. We'll we'll have, you know, we have these every month. We've got other events coming up, including the political theory and practice discussion in which I'll be talking about gerrymandering and why it's such a bad thing for uh, democracies. Um, we we got a couple other things coming up as well. So I'll see all of you in the ether somewhere. <laughs>